Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, this week, the presentation is on Nichiren Shu. And uh, the, this is the Nichiren school of Japanese Buddhism. And it's the, the last uh, of the schools founded during the Kamakura period. And this uh, is completing the entire series we have been working on for the last year, year and a half or so, um, of the introduction to East Asian Buddhism that I've been doing each month. Um, and thanks to Jake, most of these uh, uh, talks are up on the YouTubes now. Uh, we have a channel over there. Um, so again, thank you, Jake. Uh, but if you wanted to go back on the series, uh, they're, they're all there, at least most of them. Uh, and again, this is the last in this particular series, um, having covered many of the other Kamakura Buddhisms in the most recent months. Uh, and for its part, Nichiren is the last of the new schools of Japanese Buddhism, only in so much as that it was founded later, um, or the, the last out of all of those five. Um, and it's continued to have big impacts in, on Buddhism and culture in Japan today. Many of the more popular new, new schools if Kamakura is the, is the 13th century are the new schools of Japanese Buddhism, the 19th, 20th centuries are the new, new schools of Japanese Buddhism. Um, and these, uh, and, and examples of these are some of the more lay-based organizations like Soga Gakkai, uh, Ryukai, uh, Ryukai, uh, and Rishi Kosukai, which are all heavily influenced by Nichiren. However, I will say uh, up front that as we'll see, Nichiren Shu is somewhat of a misnomer, in so much as that there are several branches and sects, um, all attributed to Nichiren's teachings, but seemingly not wholly a unified school of Nichiren. There is a Nichiren Shu and a Nichiren Shoshu and other various lay groups like the ones I've just mentioned. And together, uh, they each have a particular bent on Nichiren's teachings. And although when taken together, we can say that they are part of a school of Nichiren, they operate independently from each other. However, before we get into all of those denominations, uh, we really have to talk about the person. Um, because Nichiren. I know I've said in the past, these last couple times, that they're real characters, these founders of these new schools of Buddhism, but Nietzsche then takes the cake. <laughs> um, you, he, well, this guy. For me, the defining feature of Nietzsche then is that, first of all, he comes from a lower class, um, but he has a real fervor about what he's trying to convey. And, and really, over his life, becomes a zealot and feels strongly about proselytizing, which, for, for those who don't know, is kind of different than most Buddhists, uh, what most Buddhists take in terms of how they view proselytization. But in this process, he really pissed a lot of people off. Um, and, and, but that in and of itself left a real indelible mark. He's born in uh, no, let's go. Uh, he's born in 1222 in a coastal fishing village um, in Chiba Prefecture uh, to a modest household of fishermen. Now again, it would have been modest in so much as they allowed their one of their sons to leave the household, so it wasn't too low class. Um, but the village itself would have been considered. Um, not one of the most um, auspicious. And uh, he, at age of 12, he's ushered off to uh, his local neighboring Tendai temple, <coughs> Kiyo Sumidera, which is not to be confused with Kiyo Mizudera, which is in Kyoto. Uh, Kiyo Sumidera, which later becomes known as Secho Oji, uh, but under the head priest there, who was a Tendai practitioner with a particular bent on Pure Land teachings, and he starts studying and training in Tendai at the age of 12. And over the next four years, he studies Tendai, Pure Land practices, and esoteric teachings. 
And by the age of 16, he's ordained, but he wants to learn more. And, uh, and it certainly wasn't being available at this small, uh, his small village temple. So he goes off um, for his, continues his training in Kamakura. Now Kamakura is the seat of the shogunate power at the time, um, and was starting to have a, a lot more of a prominence in terms of um, access to uh, Buddhist teachings. A lot of it was in the hotbed of Kyoto, which was much further west. Um, but he, from um, Kamakura, uh, if you can look at the map there, he goes on all the way out uh, to uh, Kyoto eventually and visits Mount Hie and uh, studies there. But then also goes on, uh, goes on to, uh, yeah, there's Kamakura. Kamakura. And, and then and goes all the way out. That's uh, where he was located. Yes, so the one peninsula yeah, on, on, the, on the right. Um, and then Kamakura is just, uh, just over that, that bay. Um, and, and then ventures all the way out uh, to the uh, west to visit Mount Hie, his studies there. He actually even visits Mount Koya, Koya-san, which is the seat of Shingonshu, um, and continues on to, uh, to um, Nara and studies at the temples there, including Todaiji. So he's, he really studies judiciously, but is obviously dismayed by court Buddhism. Um, of the day, and it's catering to the upper classes. And I alluded to this quote-unquote non-auspicious type of uh, village that I came from, mostly because it would have been considered an outcast class, in so much as his family um, gained their living and wealth from the killing of animals. And this was particularly, well again, the term outcast kind of says it, so this underpin, this outcast label underpins the fact that during his travels, he'd yet to find a master to really train with. He was being slighted for his perceived status. And therefore, he was aware of the plight that his community was under. If you can imagine, uh, you are living your life in a particular area, and the only real livelihood you have is to catch fish, for example. But that made you more spiritually sullied. And you would have to live with that knowledge. Later in his life, Nietzsche then would consider this an unfair spiritual burden that inevitably weighed on the minds of those people, his village. And Nietzsche then comes to identify strongly with that persona of just a lowly outcast priest. This helped Nichiren become so successful in the long run. He was championing the lower classes and gave meaning to the lives of those who would have been otherwise encumbered by religious, social, and political mores. He wanted a religion for the people, his people. In his studies, he latched onto a verse from the Nirvana Sutra that states, follow the Dharma, not man. Though, follow those sutras that reveal the whole meaning of the Dharma, not those that reveal only part. And this becomes emblematic of Nichiren's approach, because he was highly literal. We will see just how literal that becomes later, but this was that starting point. This helped to reinforce Nichiren's dismissal of needing to find a master. And he instead puts all of his faith in a singular teaching. And shocker, spoiler alert, it's the Lotus Sutra. <laughs> but <clears throat> Nichiren's initial goal was actually to help Tendai return to its Saicho roots of reliance only on the Lotus Sutra and not have it diluted by the teachings um, that only reveal a part. Mm. The Pure Land teachings, the esoteric teachings. And if we remember our discussions on Saicho, Saicho had to make a lot of accommodations to make his Tendai survive in Japan and had to add a lot of those elements to it. He had a reliance on the Lotus Sutra in meditation like, uh, like Jiri before him. 
So for Nietzsche then, the only teacher was Shakyamuni Buddha. And the Lotus Sutra was of highest importance, being the culmination of those teachings. Therefore, by the age of 21, Nietzsche then uh, returns back to Kiyosumidera, so back to his small local village temple, and there it is said that he first proclaims his vow and faith in the Lotus Sutra. And his direct opposition to pure land teachings, esoteric teachings, etc. And considering that the priests uh, there, who were, again, of a pure land bent, of Tendai, this really flew in their face. You know, he goes away for five years, this kid, this kid that they had trained for four, leaves for five and comes back and says, ah, you're all wrong. Let's do the Lotus Sutra. So, we may consider this his first of many ousters. He leaves the temple and takes up a hermitage outside of Kamakura, where he continues to preach the superiority of the Lotus Sutra over that of Pure Land and Zen teachings. Now, as we've mentioned in the past, uh, during this time in Japan, there were famines, weather calamities, earthquakes, etc. And to Nichiren, this came out of an adherence to what he saw as heretical views. He believed firmly that one's external life represents one's internal state. So, chaos surrounds the chaotic. And it's this argument that he uses to bolster his own claims that the, the true Buddhism to say that his is the true Buddhism to save the nation. Follow the Lotus Sutra, and all will be mended. Otherwise, the nation would continue to experience this type of chaos. He even went on so, so far as to say that um, if the course was not corrected, more than just bad weather would happen. Um, there would be an outside invader who would attack the nation. Being in Kamakura, surrounded by the shogunate powers, who mostly ascribed to Zen traditions by then, both Dogen and, and um, uh, both uh, Soto and Rinzai, uh, the shogunate felt criticized on two fronts. Both their faith and their governance were to blame for the various calamities. This obviously went over really well. By 1261, he was 29, his hermitage is attacked, and he's ex exiled to Izu, which is the um, middle of a peninsula there just below Kamakura. Ito, Izu, yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> this would have been his second exile, or, or at least Amster. And um, he was only, he was pardoned actually only a couple of years later, and he returns to his home, uh, but he's continually rebuked by the local powers. He obviously was still touting his uh, Lotus Sutra as being predominant, and, and this really reinforced his confidence in his mission. You have to understand that for those who've read the Lotus Sutra, you'll know that it states anyone expounding this teaching, especially during the age of Mapo, would experience persecution. And lo and behold, uh, and, and I'll say a little aside about that, 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 that Nietzsche then really ascribed to the notion of Mapo. We've discussed Mapo in the past, but it's the age of the degenerate Dharma, the age that we're supposedly in right now. But briefly, there's supposedly three ages um, uh, of the Dharma after the death of the Buddha Shakyamuni, the authentic or true age, the imitative, and finally the degenerative. And as we distance from the actual utterance of the words um, of those teachings, their influence basically wavers, is the argument. And thus, like Jodoshu, like Jodoshinshu, the Pure Land schools, Nichiren was heavenly Tariki, as opposed to Jiriki. Jiriki is more of uh, the, the Zen traditions, the power coming from within. Tariki is, is um, always relying on power outside of oneself. So, we cannot rely on our own capacities during this degenerate age. All of our focus 
should be on an outside influence to save us from dukkha, our pain, our discontent. For the Pure Land schools, that, uh, that's the image of uh, Amida Buddha and Sukhavati. For Nichiren, it was the Lotus Sutra. To him, the Lotus Sutra contained all the Buddhist teachings within it. And therefore, one should put their utter faith into just that. So his literal interpretation of the teachings only reinforced that he was being a true practitioner of the Lotus Sutra because he was facing these persecutions. This reinforcement only gave him more credence to become increasingly dismissive of, and actually outright violent towards, other traditions. Yeah. One, had put, uh, one had to put utter faith in the Lotus Sutra teachings and dedicate their life to that endeavor alone. Anything else was empty of meaning or value. This actually takes hold with a few people. He gains a couple of disciples and followers, and his group slowly grows. But it was really 1268 that the Mongols send a letter to the shogunate power threatening an invasion. Between the growing unrest of other religious traditions like Pure Land and Zen, even Tendai and Shingon, really not liking a lot of Nichiren's messaging, and the fear of a foreign invasion, and the fact that Nichiren was being proven right by his warning of that invasion, the shogun orders Nichiren's arrest. He was actually sentenced to death, but was somehow reprieved of such a sentence. And instead, he was sent to the Sado Island, uh, a, the small northern coastal island way up there. <clears throat> Life on Sado was harsh, cold, and altogether difficult. But this only emboldened Nichiren's <laughs> resolve. Uh, and he takes the time, this is where he takes the time to author a lot of his main teachings. He's pardoned, again, a few, a few years later, but upon his return, he was still met with an an animosity um, in, in Kamakura. And so he decides to retreat for good, seeing that he could not change the governmental powers as they were, and instead focuses on spreading the word of the Lotus Sutra to the masses. He travels to uh, he travels and establishes himself on Mount Minobu, near Mount Fuji. And it is there um, that he regains his disciples scattered after his persecution, and where he would continue to write and expound on the importance of the Lotus Sutra, and the expression of faith and devotion through recitation of the sutra's title, the Daimoku, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. Thank you so much. So, understand, to Nichiren, precepts were not of high importance. Again, no one could uphold them during an age of Mapo. So the only way to be saved is through the merits of the Lotus Sutra. He described uh, a practice that anyone could do. By chanting the Daimoku and having faith in those teachings uh, were enough to save even the most ignorant, the most lowly, or the evil person. It was it was a very limited and particular ideology, but what it provided any member of any class was a way to have a spiritual life. Which harkens back to his village roots of wishing to alleviate the burden of ascribed notions of those who can achieve awakening and those who would otherwise have very little chance. He was providing hope. He writes in a letter to a, a disciple, quote, By intoning Namu Myo Horenge Kyo, you are assured of Buddhahood. What is most important is your depth of faith. The root of the Buddha Dharma is faith. But this faith had to be in the one true teaching. If one was to use other practices, like Purulin, 
That would demonstrate a lack of faith that the Lotus Sutra had all that was needed. So you put all those other practices aside. All he, all he asked for was recognizing that Shakyamuni Buddha as the one true eternal Buddha, that the Lotus Sutra as his ultimate purpose and teaching, and that they chant the t its title as a show of gratitude and devotion. That's it. One practices by living in accordance with the Lotus Sutra teachings, by reading, reciting, copying, and expounding it to others. We're bound to be evil during Mapo. So here is as clear and concise a way to practice as one could get. We're not practicing to have a better afterlife, but to have that benefit in this lifetime. That was his perspective, and it has an impact. He spends his remaining days teaching his followers uh, at Mount Minobu until he dies at age 60 in uh, 1282. I, I should say, he was always at Mount Minobu. He, was, he got very ill in his late 50s. He decided to try to return back to his home village. He left Mount Minobu. He died in Rue. After Nichiren's death, he named his few main disciples, there were six of them, as the next leaders of his movement. However, this dissemination of the power left a bit of a vacuum, in so much as each named leader had their own perspective on Nichiren's message. These differences are echoed throughout the next several hundred years. One, one group may have uh, started to associate with other Buddhist groups. No, 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 no. Or one group only emphasized the first half of the Lotus Sutra. Another group only emphasized the second half of the Lotus Sutra. There were arguments about how to worship the Gohonzon. Uh, oh, Gohonzon. Uh, you can see it there on the, on the thing. It's on your handout. It's, it's there in the slide. That's the Gohonzon. So in the middle, that is Namu Myo Horenge Kyo. And so this would have been... Uh, as, as Monshin Sensei said in his uh, talk about calligraphy, it would have been an evoking of his, uh, how he interpreted that phrase. And so this almost becomes a mandala. And, and so it's written in big in the middle, but then it's written in tiny. It, there's a lot of vari variations of this. And he wrote himself, he wrote about 150 of them. It, it's a practice, and it's given to many uh, members of Nichi Denshu today. But even how to worship a Gohonzon was that issue. So, <clears throat> even though the school seems pretty straightforward in what was being asked, here's the sutra, here's the practice, here are Nichiren's teachings, go for it. That should be it. But even with these parameters, there is a tremendous amount of division. And therefore, through the history of the school of Nichiren, there have been several different lineages, sects, and or cults. All of which may be deemed as part of Nichiren Buddhism, but are not always unified as a single entity. And over that time, each may have prospered or declined or even died off. But for comparison, Tendai has distinct lineages within it. But they differ in form. Do the mantra, the, the mudra this way. Do the ritual that way. And not necessarily, not so much on which teachings to use, how to relate to other forms of Buddhism. And, and in all, at least, there is a unity with all most Tendai priests. We may do a ritual slightly differently, or focus on a particular practice, but the principal teachings of our school are fairly consistent. And we certainly have divisions in Tendai in, in so much as that some priests are more conservative than others, or more liberal. Some hold this view or that view. But we're at least unified as a group to be able to come together and discuss those differences. In Nichiren, 
those groups don't necessarily interact. They stay in their lane. And these divisions continued throughout the modern times. The Meiji Restoration in the late 19th century tried to eliminate uh, Buddhist influences altogether out of Japan. And therefore, Nichiren groups, the various groups, all saw different ways of handling that shift. Some became increasingly nationalistic. Some became much more globalist. Others, much more lay-based. All these divisions left the whole of Nichiren Buddhism fairly fractured. However, it cannot be overlooked that Nichiren teachings have spread internationally better than many other Japanese schools of Buddhism in terms of number of adherents. Zen has certainly had its influences, but in terms of number of adherents, um, and really it comes from a group uh, that I mentioned before, the Soga Gakkai, after, especially after World War II, but that's a whole other conversation. And that's new, new Buddhism. And that's new, new Buddhism. Thank you. Yes. Out of all of this, for me, a, f a few things stand out. Obviously, uh, Nichiren hits it on the head, and certainly it's not to be understated. Yeah, the Luna Sutra is important. If you haven't read it, I suggest you do. <laughs> it's, it's accessible. It's readable. As opposed to some other sutras, like the Alvin Tamsaka Sutra, for example, the Huahan Sutra or the Flower Garland Sutra. However, even with Nichiren's single poignant message, people's ability to make their own meaning out of it was endless. This exemplifies what Monchin Sensei talks about all the time, is that as humans, we have an infinite capacity for delusion. Mm. Even Nichiren himself took certain phrases from sutra that would best validate what he was experiencing. His disciples each took their own perspective and made Nichiren teachings be what they wanted it to be. These apparent disagreements in the basic foundations of their tradition left them separated and isolated. We can know that there are differences of opinion or perspective, but that should not keep us uh, from each other. Practicing together. Even having so much in common, they were still able to create and maintain division. Over what? This way is better than that way? Nichiren already had that argument. He already did that. Whether you agree with that overarching premise or not, He's already made that point, but for those who are following his teachings, there was division immediately after his death. I mean, I have to say, as an aside, it's a great little quip, but he, his tomb is at Mount Minobu, and there was a, a creed that said, okay, we'll, well, we'll all take turns taking care of the tomb. And so each of the disciples each had their turn. That fell apart in like two or three years. Like they couldn't even uphold taking care of his tomb. So just emblematic of how quickly it just schismed. But in the end, maybe Nichiren was right. Maybe Mapo, the degenerate age, has inherent in it a mark of disarray. Again, whether you agree with the concept of Mapo or not, hopefully we can agree on the importance of working together to reach Big T Truth. Not to work to ensure that our group is this way and that group's wrong. The other point I wanted to make is about faith. Again, to Nichiren, it was of utmost importance. He unfortunately practiced his faith at the exclusion of all others, which we might say is a little self-righteous, but faith does play a large role in studying, practicing, and living the Buddha Dharma. This, this is taking refuge. It's the trust and confidence we have in our tradition, our teachings, our teachers, yes. our Sangha. Faith is not a crutch or, or some sort of sign of weakness. Instead, it's an acceptance and an, an openness 
to unknowns. And trusting the tools that we have to deal with those unknowns. Allowing ourselves to remain changeable. Allow for transformation. And as opposed to Nietzscheden, faith also implies an openness to each other, to new ideas, to something that we cannot even conceive of with our own perception. We cannot always know the outcomes, but we do trust in the way. Despite the numerous hardships, Nietzscheden relied on his faith and a good dose of ego, but this faith helped him get through his hardships. And so what I would pose is, how does your faith help you through your hardships? We have to analyze how we deal with our dukkha, our discontent, our pain. Because how we respond to those things is a demonstration of our faith. Now, I have to say, personally speaking, I find myself having a lot of faith in complaining. And <laughs> begrudging what could have been, what have you. But that's my karma. That's my habitual reactions to any given life issue. I don't know. Take your pick. There's a lot of it. And so instead, we have to look at how we respond to dukkha to be able to know how to use those tools and rely on our faith as a demonstration. We have our teachers. We have Shakyamuni Buddha, Jiri, Saicho, Ichishima Sensei. Monshin Sensei, we have teachings, not just the Lotus Sutra, we have the Heart Sutra, and the Four Noble Truths, and the Eightfold Path, and Six Paramitas, and, and we have the Sangha, and we have each other, to feel supported, to be bolstered by, to commiserate with. If we don't respond to any of our given dukkha without that sense of faith, then we're just going through life without really demonstrating and living that Buddha Dharma. We have to rely and fall back on, trust, have confidence, hone our tools of faith. Because otherwise, we simply don't learn, don't experience, and don't grow. So, take a, a note out of Nietzsche's book. Have a lot more faith. I would certainly wish I could have as much faith as he did. Um, as faithful as I might consider myself. Um, but obviously, I still respond to dukkha without adhering to a lot of the teachings of the Lotus Sutra. I have some work to do. Yay! <laughs> That's why they call it a practice. <laughs> but it behooves all of us to really look at how we deal with hardships and question what are we actually putting our faith into? How we respond to those hardships is a demonstration of that faith. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, I will pause here just a second. Ishizuma uh, Sensei, not not Ishizuma Sensei. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I uh, just a few really quick things because today is the end of talking about Kamakura Buddhism. The end of that. Um, well, you started in China and talked yeah. about various schools in China, and you're ending with this one on Nichiren. And um, and thank you. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. Very informative. Um, and balanced. Um, the one point I want to make, two several points I want to make. First one is that while this, when we look at the major schools, you covered the major schools. There were several other very important tendencies in Japanese Buddhism and in as there was in Chinese Buddhism, but in Japanese Buddhism, uh, Ipen, Iku, Myoden, um, Myo, um, Myo, uh, right, um, one of them not Myoden, Myo, Myo, Myo A. Anyway, Myo so A. The, the point, the point is that there were numerous other teachers who had big followings during Kamakura 
after Kamakura, you know, the Muromachi period, other periods of time, many of those were itinerant monks. They walked from village to village, so they didn't really develop a place. And not developing a place meant that those schools of Buddhism died out after that charismatic founder had finished. And so just be aware that there were a number of really important teachers during that period of time that while we have their writing or their writings, historical references to their teachings, they don't have schools of Buddhism in the same way as the major schools that you talked about. That was one of the things. Another point that I wanted to make just about Nichiren is that it is often portrayed that it was Tendai that was putting Nichiren down. I've met Nichiren practitioners saying, oh, you're Tendai. You were the oppressor sort of thing. But it wasn't. It was really the state who was really on his case more often than not. And just to elaborate, the death sentence for heresy, what he did was considered heresy by saying what he actually did was he claimed that all the other schools of Buddhism were illegitimate because the only true teaching was the Daimokyu, recitation of Daimokyu through the Lotus Sutra. And that was considered heresy. And the penalty for heresy was for the priest who was the heretic to walk from his temple to the cemetery and they would stone him to death in route. That was the death sentence. And so the fact that they sent him to Sadagashima is really, you know, by the way, Sadagashima, the reason it was an exile colony, he wasn't, it was a colony of exiles. It wasn't just, there were other people other than exiles living there, but it's in the Sea of Japan. And the Sea of Japan is so rough between Nagata, which is on the coast, and Sadagashima that they have a special little boat that they go back and forth. But most people today do it by hovercraft because the sea is so incredibly choppy. Yeah. Beyond choppy. It's just, I mean, I've traveled across it. I can tell you that it's amazing that anybody ever makes it over and back. Well, the Mongols never got that far. Well, they got that far, but, you know. Sorry. Well, they usually crash on the rocks. That's why they That's why they never had a really successful invasion. Yeah, I remember crossing to one of the other exile islands on Alice, where the boat went 45 degrees. I say right. it didn't go much over 20. <laughs> Nonetheless. Anyway, so I just wanted to, I just wanted to point those those out. Any other questions? Yeah, briefly, uh, I'm going to stop the recording really quickly.